Okay. Well, I think we're going to get started. I've got two o'clock on the money here. Um, and can everybody see me? Thumbs up. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, <laughs> so my name is Allison Campbell. Um, most of you, I'm sure, um, recognize me or my name from the emails that I keep sending you at the very least. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming together for this conversation today. Um, and uh, I just want to throw out first a few quick apologies if you found the registration um, a little bit tricky. We were trying to simplify things and uh, of course trying to make a registration system do something that it's not exactly perfectly designed to do. So my apologies, um, but hopefully now that we've got some of those hiccups figured out, um, it'll be smooth sailing from here. Um, I do want to introduce my colleague, Len. Say hi, Len. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so Lynn um, is sort of helping me out um, going forward with these programs with the technology um, and so she's gonna help troubleshooting um, things on the back end for sure so um, we'll make sure that everybody has her email address um, so that when you do run into problems you can um, reach out to Lynn directly um, before we begin uh, our chat about reopening historic house museums uh, I do just want to take a minute to acknowledge uh, the really deep pain and suffering um, our communities are experiencing in response to the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and Annie Ellis here and so so many other people of color. Um, in the coming weeks expect an invitation from, from us from me to join a conversation um, about how museums can work towards racial equity um, in the meantime, uh, don't wait for, for us <laughs> to get going on that work. Please, um, you know, explore the resources that um, others are posting, um, sort of do this difficult work. So um, I did just want to begin um, with that. Uh, so we're here today to talk about reopening historic house museums. Um, I suspect that many of you were on um, that call or part of that Q&A a few weeks ago when we first began talking about this. Um, and uh, that was a big conversation um, and it became pretty clear pretty quickly that there are some unique challenges to um, historic house museums for historic house museums um, in terms of social distancing and um, sanitation and all of those kind of protocols. Um, and so it seemed like a good idea to bring everybody together for a much more kind of focused conversation about what all this means for historic house museums. I hope that you've seen um, the proposed statewide reopening plan for museums. I certainly emailed it out to tons of people. Len has just shared it there in the, the chat box um, for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. Just a few words about this. Um, the idea, and if you read the language carefully, we hope you'll see that there's quite a bit of flexibility um, in this document. Um, the goal is to have as many museums sign on um, to the document, and you can do that. It sort of explains in the document how to respond to Karen Hanen, um, the Executive Director of the Arts Commission, to say, yes, we sign on to this. Um, our organization signs on. Um, we need to sign on as many folks as we can by the end of the day tomorrow so that it can go off to the governor's office um, for approval. And the more kind of consensus there is amongst our museum community um, and support, the, the better it will look and hopefully the more quickly we can get reopened. Um, I would very much like to hear um, any questions you have about that reopening plan. I want you to know that the Washington Museum Association for Culture and myself are working to put together some reopening toolkits um, that will hopefully address, I think, a lot of the questions you might have specific to historic house museums. Just some real nuts and bolts resources, some sample signs you can post, and some language to use um, with people are confrontational about, confrontational about wearing face masks and just kind of some really useful stuff. So we know that that's needed um, and we want to support you as best we can in this. So look for those uh, materials coming soon. But do keep in mind um, at the end of this conversation, we're happy to kind of hear your thoughts on that reopening plan. Um, so the last thing I'll say, I didn't record yet. Did you record, Len? Did I hit record? Oh, it is recording. Awesome. I, either I did it and I forgot or Len did it for me. Either way, yay. Um, <laughs> the last thing I'll say before I hand this over um, 
to our presenters today to kick us off is, um, well, first of all, as you think of questions, even if folks are still talking, um, our presenters are each going to speak for five to ten minutes and then we'll open this wide open for questions. Those questions should go in that chat box. Um, we ask that everybody except the presenters remain muted through the conversation so that we can kind of hear real clearly. Um, but throw your questions as soon as they pop into your mind in that chat and we'll circle back around once the presenters are done and, and hit as many of those questions as we can. Any that we don't have time for, um, we will save that chat, find answers for you and send them out in an email along with a recording of this session um, for any of your colleagues, other volunteers or people who might be interested that weren't able to attend today. So we'll make sure you get um, all the information any resources that any of our presenters mention, we'll find those links and get those out to you. Um, okay, I think that's all the nitty gritty. Um, the very positive thing I wanted to say here at the start. Um, I think Freya and some of you um, watched the uh, YouTube video that I shared earlier today on the Facebook group um, with the directors of three historic house museums in Washington, DC, just kind of talking about the future of, of these types of museums um, in a COVID-19 world. And um, the thing I found most heartening from that conversation was that, um, that historic house museums are in some ways extremely well positioned to help our communities kind of weather this storm. Um, your, your museums tell stories about resilience and empathy and leadership in times of crisis. And those are all stories people want and need to hear right now and, and find comforting, right? And so, um, so y'all are, are in a really good place to, 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 help, to help us um, get through this. And, and so don't forget that. Now, now I know there's lots of nitty gritty um, about how to, how to just keep our building safe and our visitors safe and our staff safe. And that's mostly what we're here to talk about um, today. So I'd like to invite Freya Liggett to start. Um, she is the Curator of History at the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture. And um, as part of their museum, they also operate the Campbell House. So I'll let her um, get started. And again, as questions come up, I already see them coming in. Stick them over there in the chat um, and we will um, get started on those as soon as our presenters are done. Take it away, Freya. All right, thanks. Hey, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the MAPS uh, staging for reopening uh, since uh, we are a little bit larger institution. We have several facilities spread across our campus, uh, being our, our, our learned major, uh, excuse me, main museum building that has our galleries in it, uh, the Cheney Cole Center uh, that houses our archives and offices, and of course the Campbell House. So kind of looking at that decision making process for which one is opening um, and, and what resources we're allocating to, to each of those uh, to get us started. So um, for the MAC, we're, we're looking at kind of three stages of reopening. And uh, the first is going to be that main museum building, um, looking at social distancing, a touch free experience and kind of what we, we've termed kind of aggressive disinfecting. Um, and that's really aimed at the main goal of bringing us back into a revenue producing um, position. So, you know, number one, we're not going to go anywhere without being able to get that uh, that generated again. Um, our second um, staging is, is looking at um, kind of returning public service to our mission. So that's going to be through our archives. Um, kind of a limited uh, capacity during phase three. So, uh, you know, instead of disinfecting, we'll be looking at isolating resources um, and limited hours appointment only. Um, but uh, maintaining at least um, some level of public service to the archive. And um, our final phase, and I, I think the, the thing that I'm going to learn the most um, from you today, uh, since we're looking at reopening Campbell House in uh, phase four for the state, um, a reasoning behind that is that we've reallocated a lot of our staff to that disinfecting um, uh, need at the main, main facility. And um, we're also trying to look at it as an opportunity for, you know, are there some alternative engagement strategies, be those uh, digital or uh, maybe outdoor that we can um, start to explore while the house is closed. Um, you know, specifically reimagining our holiday program at the Campbell House, or um, we've even kind of thrown out the idea of a caretaker um, to improve our maintenance and security coverage. 
So, um, you know, trying not to look so much at access as a, as a drawback right now, but providing some room for us to reimagine the space. Um, I'm going to throw up a little list of resources that um, I worked on this morning. I think actually some of them are similar to what uh, Lynn just put up in the chat. Sorry, I'm just trying to navigate my desktop here. It's a mess. I don't know about anybody else, but my filing uh, ability during this time has really suffered. <laughs> okay, there it is. All right, so that's up in the chat for everybody to take a look at. And that really just covers um, being familiar with the general museum sector guidelines for the state. Um, and suggestions for looking at other sector guidelines uh, like retail or recreation, um, education, you know, trying to get some of our programs off uh, up and running as well. Um, and just some of the short term health and museum specific resources that were already put up in the chat and uh, some resources for some of the long term operating strategies that we're considering at the map too. I think that's really all I've got to, to go on right now, Allison. So I'm going to turn it over. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Freya. Um, we are super mindful, and Freya in particular is always reminding me um, that the majority of the museums in our state um, have little to no staff and are volunteer supported and run. Um, so while we know Freya comes from a particularly well resourced um, <laughs> museum in terms of uh, staff and, and um, revenue and all of those kinds of questions. Um, she is very mindful um, of scaling some of this stuff. And so I think a lot of the resources that she's shared and that um, you'll find at the other links, um, you know, you kind of have to think about it in terms of scale for your actual organization. So um, Holly O'Brien is also here and I'm gonna send it over to her. She is from the Puyallup Historical Society in Meeker Mansion. Um, and she is, I believe, the only staff paid staff member there. And so um, she can definitely speak to um, the, the additional challenges that that's sort of presented by or to the, the, the smaller museum. So take it away, Holly. Okay, um, so fairly recently, we've been kind of, I've been working at home. We've had volunteers kind of in and out of here checking on the house um, and doing little projects that they can do while socially distanced and stuff like that. But um, our board fairly recently just decided that we were going to close the mansion rather than reopen it during phase three when it's available until December 4th. And we kind of were bouncing it back and forth because we have huge events and we have, sorry, my phone. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> um, it's going to be either the phone or the doorbell and I've got a contractor on the roof today. So you'll get all sorts of fun noises from the mansion. Um, I swear we're only half haunted. Uh, so uh, some of the considerations we had to deal with were um, like most of you, we are largely volunteer run apart from me. So I'm tech support. I am social media. I have archives. I'm whatever they need me to be whenever they need me to be. So um, we kind of had to go through a couple considerations and the first one was the safety of our staff, volunteers and guests. So how are we going to make the museum work in a small confined space for about 10,000 square feet total on four floors and we only open about two. So it gives us around 5,000. There's a couple offices, stuff like that. So um, how do we put in um, sort of how do we provide PPE to our volunteers and our staff, which um, we are really lucky in that we have a Main Street Association that is super involved with us um, and is willing to supply that. So we ended up with that. Um, they're a fantastic resource if you have one. Um, let's see, we also needed to figure out how to get freestanding sanitation stuff because we couldn't put things on our walls. We couldn't hang anything from the ceiling. We've got art up there. Um, so we also need to figure out how our office space was going to work. We could have two to three volunteers in one office and it's, you know, probably about 300 square feet. So <laughs> just squeeze everybody in there. Um, so we needed to rotate schedules and our volunteers have been fairly kind of inconsistent. They come in when they can, whatever. <laughs> uh, so we had to, we are going to have to actually set down the schedule time. 
Um, and then we also have a problem in that our desk area, our front desk area, is about the same size as our office area. So how do we get a volunteer in there? How do we get a staff member in there? Maybe we need to interact with the guests when we can only fit about two to three guests in that space, keeping them about six feet apart. Um, so, so then we had to, you know, that kind of led into our space restrictions. Um, we kind of took what the state gave us in the, taking your square footage of each room, dividing it by 100 um, to see about how many people you could fit in with six feet. Uh, and it ended up, I think our largest room fits about three people. <laughs> So, uh, plus we have to factor in that we would need a volunteer to keep moving people through if we want to keep it a one-way space. Um, so that limits the amount of people even more. And we have furniture. There's one room that there's so much furniture in there. I'm pretty sure you probably couldn't squeeze a person in there at this point and keep somebody six feet away. <laughs> um, so some rooms we just have to rope off completely. When we get to our hallways, they're only about four feet wide in some spaces and a little bit less. So you can't have people pass each other. Um, and it's just, especially for events and other like private things that we could not figure out a way to get people in here and still leave them with enough space and our staff feeling safe and our volunteers feeling safe. So, um, and then we got into, well, even if we get past all that, how do we get the technology in the house? Because the house is 130 years old and it hates technology. <laughs> um, we have, we're still on DSL. We're working on it. <laughs> uh, so sometimes we get dropped. I'm really really happy that this call is going great so far um, so we're working on updating our internet um, and we thought we were being proactive and got rid of our website and now have a splash page and suddenly everybody wants to be on our website now um, so we have to get that back up um, we have a bunch of kind of projects that we'd already started in the mansion and we had to balance basically do we want to spend the time and effort and funds to reopen the house or do we want to put it into the projects that we've already started um, and kind of board decision and both my recommendation and some of our volunteer recommendations were that um, they would be happy to work if we didn't have to interact too much with the general public <laughs> um, i have a high-risk person at home and many of our volunteers are in the high-risk category so we were like well how do we balance this so Instead, we've decided to kind of revamp our technological stuff. So by the time we open, we can get there <laughs> and we can actually, you know, sustain it. Um, we want to update our exhibits here in the house um, and basically just do some, we're doing a major rehousing work on our archives. Um, basically just focus on updating so that when we get to, if this ever happens again, we'll be able to do it. <laughs> we'll be able to focus and actually get some information out there um, and to maybe provide a better space and um, more kind of inclusive learning environment for all of our guests. Right, thank you. Thank you, Holly. And we too are pleased that at least for the moment your technology is holding up just fine. <laughs> um, I did want to um, mention, and I, I suspect that for a lot of you, some of the things that Holly said sort of rings clear and true for you as well. Just you know, old houses had small rooms and, and not in every case, but in a lot of cases. And that makes the social distancing piece of this a particular challenge. Um, and there's also this issue of volunteers um, and protecting our volunteers. And I know John's um, has had some creative scheduling of volunteers and I'm sure he'll speak about that. Um, we are gonna talk about kind of specifically volunteers this Thursday in a session. The um, American Alliance Museums just put out some sort of guidelines um, for managing volunteers during this period. A lot of what exactly what you guys have described. Um, so we do know that's a sort of area of concern. I did just wanna mention, and I will um, throw this in the chat or ask Lynn to, to throw it in the chat. Um, the uh, Institute for Museum and Library Services um, has a, a new grant program through the state library. <laughs> so through the Washington, this is uh, money that's been designated for the state of Washington. And there's sort of three prongs to that, but one prong is um, money to help museums purchase PPE, either for your staff and your volunteers or for the public. And then one pot of money um, that's intended to encourage sort of outreach during COVID-19. Um, I haven't looked at it too closely yet, but um, the way I understood it initially was that some of that could go towards technology, boosting your technology so that you could kind of, um, you know, tackle some of these new ways that we're trying to engage um, our audiences. So um, I'll make sure that gets in the chat, but definitely take a look at those. Um, so thank you so much, Holly. 
Um, John Larson is with us from the Polson Museum in Hopium. He's been painting, I think, nonstop for three months. So we're really glad he put the paintbrush down to, to join us today. <laughs> so I'll throw it over to John. Can you hear me? All right, that's better. All right, sorry about that. Um, for those that don't know the Polson Museum, we're located in Hoquiam. We occupy a mansion that was built in 1924 for Arnold and Priscilla Polson. It's a 6,500 square foot building, and we allow the guests to come through. Uh, we don't give guided tours here, so uh, when we got thinking about how is it we're going to reopen, uh, we have felt pretty confident about the way that our layout works in terms of uh, allowing free flow of people through here. I know there's some concerns about one ways and whether people get trapped in hallways or stairways, but I think my uh, approach on that has kind of been a, a let, let adults be adults and, and when they see people in one room, don't go in there, wait until somebody's done looking and then move your way through. We'll, we'll sign the place accordingly. Um, Allison alluded to my lack of paintbrush here. I wanted to give a little back up a little bit and talk about how we spent the COVID-19 shutdown period uh, in that it's now very much a big factor and when we do open is that the day that we were given the order that we had to close I, I went into full painting mode here uh, we for years have wanted to revamp some of the rooms here take out the 1970s wallpaper that had been put in when the museum first opened and go back to the 1920s look with the solid wall colors and clean trim painting and uh, just restore parts of this building that hadn't been touched for 40 years so during the shutdown period, I came in Wednesdays through Sundays, and then a few weeks into it, I was able to stagger our collections manager, Irene Kennedy, in on a Monday and Tuesday. So we spent the entire two, whatever many months this has been, uh, hopscotching each other in the building, where she would come in and do collections work in getting ready for me to paint. So she'd remove artifacts from a room. I'd go in then after she'd cleaned it, and then begin painting. So it's just been a nonstop gallons and gallons and gallons of paint job for us. And we're still not out of the woods yet. We're very close to finishing that at this point. Uh, I've got a little bit of uh, uh, trim work to do and a couple rooms in our, in our public bathroom is still uh, pending at this point. But we're, we've made a mess is what it amounts to. So our, our building is, is very much uh, in a disarray state. And to get us ready to where we, we can allow visitors to come back in, we've, we've made some major changes where we're taking off exhibit. Uh, one room that we had had for many years as a children's exhibit room, uh, that will now be dedicated as kind of a storage space to just get us uh, up and running. Uh, we do have um, a, kind of a, a fortunate yet unfortunate situation in that in late February, we opened one of the traveling Smithsonian exhibits that Humanities Washington uh, has, has sponsored around the state called Hometown Teams, How Sports Shape America. So we had two weeks exactly of that exhibit being up and open to the public. And then of course the closure happened. So now we're in this, um, a bit of a crunch time in that Renton is the last museum to get that uh, exhibit. And we need to fit the, the schedule to where we get it for another about a month open and then Renton will have it for their month and a half and plus. Uh, so our goal is to have our museum open by the 27th of July at the latest. And we would then um, have that exhibit run for about a month and then have the takedown and then um, go on from there with our, our normal exhibition plans. But uh, but of course, we've made some major need to update our exhibits here in the next few weeks. We're going to be uh, putting things back together after the painting project. So it's kind of a, a mad dash here to the finish, if you will, when, when we're allowed to open in phase three, which uh, Grace Harbor County, where we are located, is scheduled to be eligible as of the 12th of June. So we're giving ourselves that extra two to three weeks after we're allowed to open. In theory, we're allowed to open then. Um, in which to get our space ready for that. Now, addressing things like the PPE and how our staff works, uh, we have a staff of two. So myself as director, and then we have a front desk uh, administration person who greets guests and, and does a lot of uh, additional tasks around, around the place. Uh, we have a very 
dedicated and, and uh, regular volunteer corps who come in and every one of those volunteers has their own space within the building. So we've actually been having that core come back in for the last few weeks and it's worked out really well. Everybody's got their own, essentially an office or they're working in collection storage or in a couple of cases, they're working their own buildings. We have a couple of shop buildings and we have a, a little house we're restoring right now for collections storage, although that took a back seat to the big restoration in the mansion. So when it comes to reopening, uh, it re will really be only the front desk person who has any direct contact with the public. So we're feeling pretty good about um, having that person, of course, be masked at all times when guests are coming. Everybody in their own office is a guest is allowed not to do that until we, they interact with each other. So uh, a little, uh, what do you call it, hand sanitizer at the front desk and uh, and lots of signage to direct people around and, and then a good introduction. We, th we think it should work okay as far as uh, allowing folks to, to wander through our, through our building at that point in time. Um, going back to the Smithsonian exhibit, there's one thing I know Allison wanted me to share a little bit of an idea that we had on this. One of the, the requirements actually of having one of these Smithsonian exhibits is that you have public events and public gatherings and so forth. So we initially scheduled two programs through Humanities Washington to be the uh, Inquiring Minds series. Those are being postponed until the fall when we hope that we'll be able to have a, a bigger gathering of, of people within our building. Um, but we wanted to do one kind of bigger event that would actually bring people to the museum in mass. And the, what we thought we'd do with that is a tailgate party. And we, in fact, I've looked at the governor's recommendations for drive-in movie theaters as my guide on this. In the drive-in movie theaters, you're allowed to bring your whole family in in a vehicle, and you're supposed to stay 10 feet apart from your next vehicle. But we have a fairly sizable uh, grounds here where we're allowing people to park on our lawns and so forth. And then we'll be um, encouraging them, of course, to party in their own vehicle, basically. But uh, we'll, we'll administer, administer tickets that would be like a time ticketing that would let people come in during that event to see the exhibit. And then... I'm not quite sure how it's going to work, but we're hoping to do a little parade too, where people would kind of, in their sports attire, uh, wander through the the tailgate party area that that we've uh, that we've created for that. So hopefully that works out. But that's one of our thoughts on on how to get a, a kind of an event event during the middle of the summer that would be thematic with the exhibit that we have, and that would uh, you know give people a, a little chance to break out and enjoy themselves. Um, we are, for the first month of being reopened, uh, planning to offer free admission to the public. And we're doing that because we feel that um, just with the way that the economy has gone in the tank and so forth, that it would be perhaps more beneficial to us even financially to just on the goodwill of people's um, generosity, come and see their local history museum. And then the hope is, in addition to having some out of town guests, that we'd encourage people to be tourists in their own town. So, um, so we'll see how that goes, but that's, that's our plan for now. Um, we are doing a, a staff change as well. Our, our assistant who's been with us for a few years is getting married. She actually had to put that off. So uh, not to get too specific, but we're also doing a transition to a new staff person at the same time. So everything's kind of coming to a, a, a real distinct point in time where everything will change and we'll be open and we'll have new people working here. It should be should be fun. So we'll see how that goes. So awesome. I had a, had a question there. How do you get the word out to your community that you'll have free admission um, through our newspaper, through Facebook, through a uh, radio show that uh, we have? I, I do a daily radio program, and that's something that's really kept our museum active with the public for the last, well, I mean, it's been for the last eight years straight. But uh, for the last three months in particular, we've been able to give in the intro and the extra to our daily, we call it the daily centennial moment. It's a, it's me reading the news from 100 years ago that day in history, every day of the year, uh, for about a four minute spot on five different radio stations that broadcast in Grace Harbor County. Uh, if anybody's curious about that, you can go to either kxro.com or kghifm.org, and those have streaming services that uh, eat 35 in the morning on KXRO. And, um, I uh, forget the other times, but nonetheless, it's a great way to get the word out and we'll be using that platform as a, as a way to advertise that too. So. 
Um, I think that kind of covers our, our world here. It's just paint central. That's all I can really say is uh, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I've enjoyed this time really not, I'm so tired of painting, but I'm definitely uh, looking forward to be done of painting and back to where, um, you know, we'll, we'll be back to normal in a, in a some semblance of, of that word. So. Yeah, well, thank you, John. And whenever I've felt a little down, I've pictured you painting and being <laughs> productive at the Polson Museum, and that's lifted my spirits. I know you've worked really hard during this downtime. Um, I did just want to mention a few things that uh, John brought up. Um, you know, those of you who have some kind of outdoor space um, as part of your site, um, that's definitely something that you're going to look to to or have an opportunity to maximize during this period. Um, and so thinking creatively about how to use that outdoor space, even if you can't reopen your building or don't feel like you can safely reopen your building um, is going to be uh, really important. Um, and also just the idea of, um, you know, looking to other industries, you know, John mentioned looking at what the kind of guidelines were for, for, um, for driving movie theaters, right? So, um, you know, we're all, everybody's winging it, everybody's building the plane as we fly it. Um, and so kind of thinking about where you can maybe seek out some of that information, I think is um, really, really smart. So there was something else I want to say. I wanted to say, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> um, so um, until I do remember, I definitely um, encourage you to start submitting questions. Now, um, you know, I invite the presenters to kind of just share their their thinking around reopening as um, people who work in and run historic house museums. Um, they don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. But we um, definitely, it's, it's valuable for us to hear your questions. Um, and that allows me to kind of go back and dig up any answers that we don't have. So um, I wanted to, to first start with um, Richard, who had a question about, um, specifically about hand sanitizers um, in historic buildings and the potential damage of commercial hand sanitizers on banisters and doorknobs and things like that. Um, I don't know if anybody either on the call or any of the three of you um, ha have come up with or know a source for um, hand sanitizers that are maybe better. Um, it's a lot of science and chemistry that I don't really understand. But anybody have thoughts on that? I, I can say just a couple things. Um, we've been fortunate to have glass doorknobs in our building for the most part and a brass front entry doorknob. Um, and then all this new painting that we're doing is, uh, you know, it's very modern, easy to wash sort of surfacing, uh, including our banister, which is getting refinished as well. So to use like a real mild bleach solution, something along those lines, I'm not too worried about it from our standpoint, just because we're not allowing people to touch the things that, uh, you know, artifact wise, that kind of stuff. But in terms of parts of our building, it, it should be uh, should be okay, uh, at least we, we think so. Uh, bathroom components, you know, handles on sinks and things of that nature. Uh, the, the pull chain on our old ripcord toilet uh, is a is kind of an old big light ball thing, so it should be, I don't know, should be all right to, to do some of the uh, basic cleaning on those things without harming anything. At least that's our, uh, our, our thoughts, so. Yeah, yeah. Anybody, El Tali or Freya? Have you looked um, and, yeah. yeah, in that in that list of resources there um, in the uh, PDF that I put up there, there is a link to, oh, let's see, it's, it's a resource out of, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at it right now. It's from the National Center for Preservation Technology, and they, they go over just some, some basics for disinfecting cultural resources. And it, it, it's, it's a pretty useful uh, little um, video and uh, transcript that they have on their website. Yeah, I think that um, Angela also had a similar question, particularly around collections work and um, the damage that hand sanitizers can kind of do to mm -hmm. collections. And I think that that's covered in that resource. Yeah, Freya? It is. Um, and, and I think that's probably one of the things that's, um, you know, interesting or important to point out about the way that we're approaching our main gallery opening versus our archives is the main gallery is really based on that disinfecting protocol and the archive is completely based on isolation and you know how those uh, how those materials are going to be placed aside for a certain amount of time and who has access to them uh, so you know kind of the two different strategies you might want to consider before you know saying i have to commit to disinfecting 
Yeah, for sure. And I do know that um, with our own collections at the State History Museum, we are quarantining um, new acquisitions um, for, I think, a two week period for sure. Um, I will just mention to John that there are um, folks on the line who are a little jealous that you got so much done during the, <laughs> the period oh. of closure. <laughs> I do I do know for government buildings, you know, we were not allowed um, back yeah. into our building and that's been a source of frustration, I'm sure, for folks who felt that they couldn't get into their space. So, um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, uh, has multiple units that contain pictures and documents that tell the area of story. How do we protect and keep virus clear of these folders, one of the units is, um, so my friend from Tolt had a question specifically about multiplex units, um, which I, I don't know what those are, those, because I'm not a collections person, um, that contain pictures and documents that tell the area story. How do we protect and keep virus clear of these folders once, uh, so I suppose if you have multiple people handling them, um, I suppose one option is always, the old school cotton gloves that you can wash and sanitize and reuse um, would be safe. I'm not sure if that exactly um, answers the question. I will say this in terms of, and this is what sort of the recommendations are in the state reopening plan, um, not necessarily per, uh, specific to collections, but exhibits, um, things that are high touch that you cannot um, either, um, you know, put in a place where they will be more difficult to touch by the public um, or sanitize easily. The recommendation is really to consider taking those things off exhibit. Um, and again, that's not forever. <laughs> um, that's sort of temporar temporarily. I mean, unless you can have a volunteer in that gallery space to discourage people from touching things. Um, if you feel like you can um, adequately use signage and stanchions to keep people away from those sorts of things that can't be sanitized, right? Like the um, historic textiles on covered chairs and things. If, if you know pre-COVID, this was something that people were tempted to sit down on, <laughs> even, even though that might not have been um, the expectation. Um, th those, those sorts of things are going to take some creative, creative thinking. The state guidelines does leave a lot of flexibility um, for how you might deal with that kind of stuff, but we're aware that especially in historic house museums, um, yeah, there are just things that can't be, can't be wiped down with Clorox, um, and, and that presents some, I think, unique challenges. Um, Mary Ann from Silica recommends just soap and water, um, not bleach, um, to, as it'll ruin sort of finishes, especially, especially if you have sort of um, unique finishes on things. Um, let's see. Well, Allison? Yeah. And this is Sharon from Tolt. Yeah, hi Sharon. Okay, the multiplexes that I was talking about, that's what they are. And the problem is, is the only way to look at them is to do this. Yep. We have six of them in our small space. So the only thing I, we could come up with so far is the inexpensive, cheap uh, plastic gloves like you see at a sandwich store. Does anybody have any better ideas? Because we also, you know, people are going to, anyway. Yes, um, I don't have any better ideas except to also say, um, and, and I bet there are folks on the line who might have some other ideas for you. Um, <laughs> The, the, the frequent cleaning of these sorts of things is just going to become part of our daily routine for volunteers. Um, and, and so, you know, unless you're having a mad rush, which we hope you're not having 100 people in your museum, <laughs> uh, you know, getting in the habit of wiping those things down between groups of visitors, I think is, is going to be um, your best strategy for, for kind of keeping folks safe. But you're right, exactly. That's a perfect example of um, you know, sort of a unique um, kind of problem that you wouldn't necessarily find um, in other, in other, in every museum or in other industries, right, um, that we're kind of looking, looking for. Yeah, somebody um, recommended using um, mm -hmm. styluses, so like a stick or a, something that could be disposable that could be used to turn them um, even. I know um, lots of museums are looking at those sorts of things for, um, you know, interactive touch surfaces. If it's a computer um, screen, you know, kind of disposable stylus so that, um, you know, people can pick one up, interact with the, with the technology and then it can, can be thrown away. Um, also, I had something I wanted to add to that. Please, Freya, yeah. Um, I, I know in talking from a couple of friends that, uh, you know, a lot of folks have to track um, visitation for, you know, purposes of their, of their tax funding. 
uh, for, for tourism. Um, so there, there was a suggestion to use um, pens and kind of like move them from the used or move them from the new to the used pile uh, and sanitize those as people sign into your guest registers um, or, or you're collecting information in some other way. So, you know, kind of having a, a sanitation cycle for, for those. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great suggestion. I love that. Um, I'd, I'd concur with that. Just uh, having been to our local brewery recently where I had to sign a receipt for a purchase there. Uh, they just had a vat of, uh, I assume bleach water, and then they had another vat of pens, and then they just take the pan, fresh pen, hand it to you, you sign your name, and then they threw that pen in the bleach water. Well, with the, uh, the multiplex units that we were just discussing there, it, maybe not a pen, but if you had something that you checked out as part of the admission to the front desk that says, when you are in our museum, here's your particular little gripper thing, whatever, you know, pair of, a pair of pliers for lack of a better term, but um, something that they would just carry with them until they checked out, kind of like you do with a, an audio uh, tour uh, where they check out an audio guide to you. And then at the end of that, that would go back into the pile and get sanitized. So, um, you know, just get creative on whatever that device is. Yeah, for sure. And I think that these sort of little mini systems within our museums are going to be the things that we're going to have to kind of work together to, to figure out, um, you know, the kind of processes for that, um, because I know folks will have different ideas and things will work differently for different spaces, but something similar with, um, so I know a lot of museums are struggling with sort of figuring out if they're going to provide masks for the public um, or if they're going to require masks, which is the recommendation that you require masks. Um, will they be available for sale in the gift shop or how, how that kind of works and you know you pick up a mask here and you throw it away here and kind of keeping that all separate and again all of the kind of mini systems that are going to have to be um, created to manage all of this kind of sanitation. Um, I know masks are a big issue. We had a long conversation on a call yesterday. Um, uh, some of our, you know, museum colleagues have started to reopen um, in Ellensburg and other places. And so they're kind of the pioneers in this. And, um, you know, they were really worried about pushback um, from folks not wanting to wear masks um, in their in their spaces. Um, that they've generally found that it's been fine and most people are, are agreeable. Um, but again, some kind of talking points um, around kind of the mask requirements and, and when folks um, don't want to wear masks and, and get um, kind of confrontational about it. Um, we'd like to provide <laughs> their Sharon with her mask looking good, um, provide some support um, for that. Um, yeah, how places will deal with non-compliant people. We're, we're aware of, of that as a potential issue, particularly depending on where you are in the state um, and what the general feeling is about um, about wearing masks um, where you are. So we're gonna, we're gonna um, this toolkit that we've talked about will include um, free principal signage um, about all of this, about mask requirements, about social distancing, things you can just print out or go to Kinko's and print out and put up. Um, you're certainly encouraged and welcome to design your own, um, but uh, we're gonna try and make some of those resources available. Um, you know, and folks will get better at this, right? I mean, we all, I, I still don't remember to go the correct way down the aisles in the grocery store, but um, I, I mess it up a lot less every time I go. So I think we're all gonna kind of get better better at this. Um, so Carla says we have a gift shop in our museum. What are the requirements for disinfecting when there are dozens of items people can touch? Have them wear gloves? I don't, yeah. So um, there is not a piece of the reopening plan that kind of deals with gift shops specifically, but there are lots of recommendations from the commercial retail sector. Um, and I think the expectation is that if you have a museum in uh, a shop in your museum that you'll follow those um, retail guidelines um, for sure. I know that Sadie's on the call and some other folks have had some really great ideas of just putting, you know, they have a huge book um, collection at their bookstore, lots of books in their store and putting them in Mylar envelopes so that people can pick them up and look at them and then they can be wiped down. And if there's something they want to buy, it gets pulled out of the back, right? So I know that, um, the MAC is not planning to reopen their store as part of the first phase of reopening, right, Freya? I'm sorry, I actually don't know that. <laughs> yeah, I think, I'm trying to remember what Wes said. Um, I don't think they're planning to do it right away, but I do think that when they do reopen, as an example, you don't want all of the 
the tchotchkes out at once or all the stuffed animals out, you might have one out um, that can, you know, as a sample. Um, so again, some of the kind of creative thinking around how to make those spaces safer because we know that the stores are a huge source of revenue for you all. So yeah. We did spend some time um, building our online sales capability in the last couple of weeks. So, you know, just selling books and puzzles and things like that, that, that that's happened in the meantime. Yeah, for sure. And um, it brings up the idea of sort of online stores um, brings up another thing that I wanted to remember to mention um, is uh, ticketless, moneyless uh, transaction for admissions. And I don't know, um, I know that the Mac has, has is working on that. I don't know about John and, and Holly, but um, I know that a lot of smaller museums don't have a point of sales system um, that would allow them to set up um, you know, touchless, you know, pre-sale um, tickets. Uh, there are, I think, some options out there, um, you know, some lo-fi options, Eventbrite or any of these kind of ticketing platforms that you might use for big events. They have apps. So as far as the accessibility goes, even folks who don't have Wi-Fi and internet at home can still pre-purchase tickets off the app and then there doesn't have to be any exchange of money. Um, so that's one thought. I also know that a lot of you are um, donation driven and I know that John mentioned at least potentially when the Pulse and reopens. Um, you know, if, if suggested donations are how you roll and that's that's what you've always done before, then you're in a really great spot, right? Because there doesn't have to be somebody at the front desk um, taking money for admission. There can be a bin and people put the money in the bin and <laughs> and nobody else has to touch that. Um, so um, definitely the, for those of you who are maybe considering waiving admissions here in the beginning, just a donation bin um, might be all, all you need to kind of cut down on that risk right at that point of entry as people are coming into the museum. Um, there is money again in this in this IMLS grant if you need to buy the sneeze guards or whatever we're calling the plexi that you see um, all over. Those things are definitely recommended um, again if they're possible probably particularly if you have a very tiny entry space like all these. Um, you know that's something to maybe um, consider if you feel like you can't um, safely socially distance in that space. Um, so there's definitely lots of ideas around that. Len has shared some of the, um, the retail guidelines um, that might be helpful and folks again if you're concerned about I know stores there's a lot of concern about stores in particular, museum stores. If you read those retail guidelines and you're not finding the answers you need, let me know. And, um, you know, I have ways of getting to folks in the Department of Health and, um, and trying to get answers for you. So if you feel like just you're not finding it, um, for sure, let me know. Um, Allison. Yeah. One of the weird things that I have seen instead of a plexiglass shield, um, I've actually seen this in a couple small stores. And we were considering doing it for a while when we were thinking about opening is you can get like kind of PVC pipe and literally just put a clear shower curtain over it. And as long as it kind of covers you, it can still be disinfected with alcohol and you're still, your person is safe. You don't have to mount anything. The weird yes. thing that works. <laughs> yes, I, I love that. And I think that's the kind of ingenuity we're going to need um, these days. And again, it might not look pretty, but I also just want to remember that none of this is permanent. Um, you know, we've got to get through this. We don't know how long we're going to have to kind of um, deal with these extraordinary and unusual circumstances. Um, but uh, hopefully this is not, you know, how things will be um, going forward. Yeah, Marianne also recommended Mylar as a shield. I know, I, I can't remember if it was Jennifer or somebody who also had the idea of, you know, taking some vitrines, you know, the plexi pieces you put over your exhibit cases. And if you turn one on your side, it's a bit of a shield. Now, I don't know if you want to cut a hole in it. If it's an old one, I guess you can to slip the money through or reach your hand around or, you know, <laughs> kind of look around your storage space and see if there's something that that might work. Um, so there's definitely some great information in the chat. I'm just trying to read it, read it and catch up. Yeah, plexiglass can easily be disinfected. Um, those are all great uh, suggestions. Um, oh, the idea of having, yeah, having a, um, a sort of volunteer kind of assigned to a shopper in the store to handle things um, for you. Maybe that person's wearing gloves, that kind of thing. Um, again, we don't, you know, want to, so maybe that's a good place to put all of those college kids who are home for college and don't have anything to do, ask them to come in and be personal shoppers in your museum store. 
um, with folks. I love that. Um, so well, I think one of the um, it, maybe the, one of the advantages that small museums and, and these houses have right now is that I think people are going to be looking for these at, you know atmospheres where they do feel like they're out of out of the big crowds and they're going to feel a little bit safer about going back into pub the public and, and and I think that that idea of a personal shopper is great because you know there's a lot of opportunities for those one on one interactions that are going to be so so valuable and so appreciated I think in the in the coming weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you just kind of reminded me, and I think maybe can't remember when which three of you, which one of which one of you mentioned it. Um, but it also came up on that YouTube video, the idea that people are going to be really staying local and looking for, you know, I don't think folks are going to be real quick to jump on airplanes and do those big summer trips. Um, but hopefully they'll be coming to you and engaging in their local community and your historic sites. Um, in a more meaningful way this summer. Um, and so to that point, um, Shanna had a question about, um, you know, just beefing up some of those outdoor displays, um, you know, uh, wayfinding signs, the kind that are just impermeable and last through and through weather, all kinds of weather are super, super expensive. Does anybody have any ideas for um, just kind of doing some outdoor signage, some outdoor interpretation um, in a way that uh, can kind of hold up through the summer and, and give people some information while they're walking your grounds. What do you guys have around the Campbell House, Freya? You have some signage. Fancy signage, though, I think. Oh. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but I, I have um, talked to some folks at, uh, was at the uh, Harbor History Museum. They've been doing window displays uh, for, for places that you know, they can they can have people walking past or courtyards uh, kind of utilizing some of those areas that might be a little bit more secure. Yeah, I've seen a couple of museums doing that a museum um, up in Vancouver, BC that just had luckily had these nice big windows and just put all they literally took the panels from their exhibits and just turned them and hung them in the windows so that people could walk by. Um, absolutely. How about um, Holly, I know you also have a lot of outdoor space. Do you guys have any thoughts about how you're going to use that? We do, and actually um, it has more to do with, we have an event here, it should have been actually, I think in a couple weeks, Meeker Days, and even though we're the Meeker Mansion doesn't always happen around the mansion, but this year it is kind of adjusting, and we have the option to offer them more space. So we've kind of partnered with, um, oh, I can't remember what the name of the group is, but it's, it's old cars, they're like vintage cars. So we have a big lot that they can face kind of downtown in. So we're gonna use that and kind of distance them. And I'm not sure if people are able to stop yet to kind of get out to look at them. We also have um, Ezra's 1926 wagon um, with tons of signs that already come with it. So we're gonna try and just kind of put that in little spots maybe around downtown. The city's super awesome. Like they're, they don't care what we do with it as long as we don't run anybody over. <laughs> um, so we're kind of trying to use the wagon to kind of bring people down or even just participating in other events that are going on around where we don't necessarily have to bring as many volunteers um, and we can stay a little bit further away from people but still kind of let them know what's going on with us. Um, we're also putting out a lot of, we're working with Sign Dog to kind of a, a local business down here to make bigger kind of signs from our um, are two streets that we border uh, and the city right now is waiving fees to put up permanent signs. So that's, that's great. So those will be something you're doing now, but they'll be there permanently. Yeah, yeah. So we're it's basically just enhancing our signage right now. Um, ours are kind of old and they keep getting busted out because unfortunately we have a lovely population um, just down the street from us of uh, homeless people who some can be very protective and some are very destructive. So <laughs> we got to balance that as well. Yeah, I do know for you all and many others, vandalism has been an issue during this period of closure, but um, you guys have handled it like a champ. Um, so questions about phase four. There have been a couple of questions about what we think things will look like in phase four, and I don't have any answers to those questions, except I think that we can maybe assume that there will be room for larger gatherings of people, um, both outside and potentially inside. Um, now, you know, we at the State History Museum have canceled all of our large summer events. Um, those are typically, 
you know, draw a thousand people plus. So there's no way we were going to, to kind of be able to host those no matter what phase we were in um, anytime soon. Um, so I don't know, has anybody, anybody heard anything about phase four and the potential? Was, phase four was when there, basically a vaccine has been produced at that point, if I recall. And so at that point, the assumption is that large sporting events can take place and everything goes back to what we thought of as normal before. So are, is there a confusion on that in phase three or, or Maybe, is that, I might is that be, the question? I might be skipping ahead and imagining there was a phase, phase five that the world all goes back to normal. Phase but. three allows for 50 people to assemble in any given spot. And our, our speaking of our little museum has a space for about 48 people in our main uh, uh, room. So we're actually going ahead with two wedding and wedding receptions that had been pre-scheduled back a year ago uh, that are in August and those were about 20-25 people. So we feel okay under the rules to just go ahead with those as, as previously planned. They're not open to the general public, they're just a you know like a family type gathering. But, um, but yeah we're hoping to resume some limited uh, event usage of our building when when the phase three is in place. Yeah. Yep. And um, I do know that, and thank you for bringing up that question about event rentals. I know that um, that's a, a pretty important revenue stream for a lot of folks um, out there. And uh, so again, there might be need to be some special attention about around kind of treating rentals versus treating public events at, at your museum and, and kind of some additional considerations. Do you guys have any specific kind of thoughts about what you'll be sort of encouraging and enforcing for those rental groups? Well, we one of our uh, biggest uh, usages of our building is for baby showers, bridal showers, wedding, small wedding receptions, that kind of thing. And those tend to be, you know, an, an individual's immediate friends and family that are part of that. So um, I would guess that there wouldn't be too much beyond that that we'd be dealing with. But, uh, uh, you know, the idea of the tailgate party thing is the biggest randomized group of people that would come but we hope to engineer that to where it could be done safely and without ruffling anybody's concerns over in infection so um so that'd be one thing i would mention that because of the cancellation of just about every public event in our county for the next foreseeable four months you know car shows the county fair um, festivals that would have gone on you know we've had to cancel our biggest fundraiser for the year, which is a car raffle. We, we give away a brand new automobile every year. And, and that requires that we get out and hawk tickets at those events. And now we, we just we can't do that. So um, so getting creative about how we make up that difference in our budgets, kind of a yet another challenge of this whole reopening thing. And I think that, you know, just in the, in the literature we'll put out through newsletters and through a radio program and so forth, just making that uh, known that we've had this gap in our budget is uh, hopefully will you know open people's pocketbooks a little bit towards feeling feeling like their museum matters to them so we hope i've definitely been really heartened to hear um from folks who either have started to reopen or have been doing online virtual programs um, for a suggested donation or an encouraged donation. The response has been really positive. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that next week in a session about virtual programming and that kind of pay what you can model. Um, and uh, I, think, I think in general folks uh, recognize that our cultural institutions need their support right now. Um, you know, and as much as we're all putting attention on, you know, basic needs kind of services um, in the midst of COVID, um, hopefully folks haven't forgotten about us and uh, it, it appears as though they're eager to support us and um, and there have been a lot a lot of studies and research done on how comfortable the public feels about returning um, to different kinds of cultural spaces um, and I will assure you that um, the, the prospects look pretty good for museums particularly museums with outdoor spaces um, but museums in general um, it's a little bit different when people think about returning to a, a movie theater or a live performance, a concert hall, things that um, require being in a confined space, even if it's a large confined space with a lot of other people for a prolonged period of time. Um, it, it appears from the research as though um, those sorts of organizations will have a little tougher time um, making people feel safe in their space than museums because folks are kind of looking Looking forward to getting back to to all of, to all of our organizations and all of our museums. Um, so I want to assure you. I think, it, it, Len, if there's any questions that pop out at you that I forgot 
let me know. Um, and if I see any, once we've wrapped up, I will be sure to send it out in, in the wrap up email that I'll share with everybody that will include all of these links. that will recruit, include a recording of this session. Um, but I mostly want to thank John and, and Holly and Freya for being here today. Um, and again, Clearly, we don't have all the answers, but I thought it was um, important to share a little bit of the thinking um, from folks who have decided maybe not to reopen immediately in, 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 in the next phase or two, and then um, from John, who's um, looking forward to reopening and doing that safely. Um, so I think that those are sort of different sides of the coin and really useful um, uh, to kind of hear a little bit of their thinking. Um, so we have another session just like this. Q&A, real informal. I feel like we're all family now. So um, I hope that we'll see uh, many of you uh, this Thursday for a conversation about volunteers, which is very much connected um, to this same conversation, right? Um, and we know so many of you are, are volunteer dependent and we wanna make sure we're keeping our volunteers safe and, um, and encouraging and supporting them in the right ways. So um, all of that information um, is available in our Facebook group um, uh, and emails from me. Um, Len just threw up the link to join the Facebook group. So um, with that, thank you all so much for spending this time with me. Again, thank you to our presenters. Thanks to Len. And um, I hope to see most of you on Thursday where we can continue um, this conversation. So everybody take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, thanks, Allison. Allison. Bye, Holly. Bye, Freya. Thank you, Len. Okay. I'd like to hear about the answer to the question about how many are not reopening. How many? Um, that's a good question. And of the folks on the line, I don't know. But of the three presenters on the line, two of them are not reopening this summer. And one of them is reopening this summer. Just Holly? So Holly and Freya, both of their sites at the Campbell House and um, the Meeker Mansion um, do not have plans to reopen um, probably until December, right? At the soonest, is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, yeah, but that's a great question and I will throw that question out to the, to the Facebook group and just maybe do a poll and see if we can get some, some feedback. Linda from McCleary says they're not, well, yeah, they're not open because they're in the middle of building a new museum, creating a new museum. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Sharon, I'll try and find some more kind of stats on that for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.